here in, in Christ, and I'll share my screen. Fantastic. So, uh, firstly, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me, Rich. It's a, a shame that the business show isn't happening. Uh, we all had a stand and stuff, and I was looking forward to speaking. I know there are a couple of other people that I speak with regularly who are also looking to come along, educate and motivate you guys. So, it's a pleasure to be here today to share with you some experiences. And for those of you that haven't been in a session with me before, please turn your sensitivity meters down to zero. Uh, I'm not here to offend, but I did hear there was a HR person coming on, so you never know. I just want to give you some feedback, some advice, some experience from somebody who runs a couple of businesses. I've been doing this for a number of years. I've been supporting businesses for a number of years. And I do it with passion and energy. But I'm no expert. I don't want to be an expert in anything. I don't even like the term expert because you used to be a spurt. So I'm not a big fan. I just like to get people enthusiastic about all aspects of business, finance, marketing, sales, systems, people, and get everything pumping so that we can perform better. And right now, more than ever, our communities need it because I'm a big believer in when businesses perform well, we pay our team. And when we pay our team, they've got money to spend. And when they've got money to spend, the high street benefits and everything else and the community moves on and the economy moves on. So... I don't believe in big society, government stuff, anywhere near as much as I believe in business succeeding, therefore the economies can succeed and communities can. So being invited into a unity and community like this, I appreciate. So without further ado, I want to talk about uh, you have a duty of care to market and sell in today's market. And I, I really want to provoke some thoughts within you and challenge some thinking. Some of it is going back to some of the things when you first started, but also some of it is looking forward. I've not been attacked, that's a, post, that's a postman just uh, <laughs> shoved somebody through the door. So, um, working from home, right? I want you to kind of challenge your thinking, go back a little bit, reframe and plan and protect and serve. So there's a number of principles I'm gonna go through with you. I'm gonna ask you to write some stuff down and do some exercises with me remotely, and then I'm gonna give you a gift of time at the end of this one to when if you want to, to take it up so we can go through this in a bit more of a one-on-one a -on -one strategy, which I'm happy to do, because not everything we do comes with an input. So let's let's get into this a little bit further. So let me see if we can get this clicker working. Lovely. So thank you for, for letting me come. This is me. All right. I am Adam Brooks. I run a number of businesses. I don't want to bore you for too long, but I, I run firework events, firewalk events and crazy things, as well as marketing workshops, sales workshops. I did 60, 60 workshops last year for a charity raising money, uh, half-day workshops, which are like £400 a pop. We did those for free to raise money for Gloucestershire Royal Hospital. And it was a raging success. And I have yet to find an event photographer who likes to take photos of me that gets me in good position. So as you see from these images, this, this is me presenting, right? I run at 100 mile an hour. I pull all sorts of silly faces. I'm a human being that makes mistakes because I believe the only people that don't make mistakes don't go anywhere. So I'm going to give you warts and all. Uh, because I asked you to turn your sensitivity meters down, I'm not going to swear like a fishwife, but they may just drop out and I may see something that a 1970s BBC presenter innuendo king would be proud of. I don't mean any offense, it just kind of kind of comes out unfiltered. I've got 30 minutes to educate you and inspire you and motivate you. So I'm going to do my absolute best. So let's crack on. What I want to do is get you thinking. And before we do, to precursor that, a little bit about us and our team is we are 100% abnormal and proud to be. So in terms of the way that we operate business and the way that we work with businesses, we don't do this via a textbook. So we don't do coaching via a grow model or something. We don't need a certificate to do what we do in that sense. We're very qualified and very educated. But what we're interested in is being abnormal. Because if everyone's doing everything the same, I want to be 1% different to everybody else. And I want to encourage you to think about that in your industry. How can you be 1% different right now? Because standing out, you don't have to be 100% different. You only need to be a tiny percent different to all your competitors to stand out for either the right reasons or the wrong reasons. And it's up to you to choose what you're doing to understand the difference. So, can I ask you to write this number down, please? Pen and paper, if you can just write down 24 for me. Now, whether we like it or not, in 1520, we adopted the Gregorian calendar, and that's got 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 and stuff. So none of us are powerful enough to change that. But we have the same amount of time every single day. And I don't know if you, like me and like some of my clients, there's an expectation that we have more time on our hands right now because we're working from home with less traveling and all that sort of stuff, great. But we're also parents, we're also trying to balance relationships, friendships, maintain contact with people in the outside world, and we're also meant to be teachers. I know we've got a week off now with half term and stuff, but all this has kind of come into 
a short space of time and concentration working from home, I've done it for years. It's a challenging space if people haven't done it. So within 24 hours, it breaks down to this format. Eight, we normally sleep. If you're any good at sleep. Eight, we normally work. Eh. Self-employed people going, eight, I'd love it if I only worked eight. I can remember at once work at eight. Normally we work 13, 14, 17 hour days. That's the beauty about being self-employed. You can choose which of the 23 hours of the 24 you work during a day. The other eight, the other eight, we get to rest, we get to play, we get to learn, we get to be family member, we get to cook, we get to exercise, we get to work out, we get to read, you know? We get to watch YouTube, we get to watch The Tiger King on Netflix, which is insanely addictive right now for me. But in general, what we do is kind of waste. We waste a lot of time. So this is getting warts and all honest now. I want you to look at your three eights. I want you to write down, not just now, but after this call, I want you to think about what are you doing with your eights? How much sleep are you getting? Because we need sleep from a nutrition point of view, from an energy point of view, from a, our body's working and functioning properly. Sleep deprivation is like torture. So we need better sleep. So what can we do to get better sleep? I can help you with this stuff, but ultimately it's about decisions, habits, behaviors and stuff. So how is your sleep? Think about those eight hours. Are you getting them regularly? Think about your working day. How are you structuring your working day in a period now where the kind of days and the weekends blur into? Somebody said it's Good Friday this Friday. I completely lost track. So days are blurring into other days. So how are we being productive? How are we being present in the time when we are productive? And I find shorter bursts. So if this helps for you guys as a top tip, I tend to work 45 minutes and a 15 minute kind of wrap up. So I work in hour blocks, 14, five minutes, concentrated time on a particular thing, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, get a cup of tea, have a piss break, come back in, recalculate, bang back on again. And that's how I like to work, concentrated times. My brain can only function for 45 minutes before it switches off. So a gauge for that for me is when my bum starts to shuffle, my brain's already switched off. So how are you working productively and what habits can you build to be more productive in the time that you've got within those eight working hours? And then in the other eight, what are you doing in terms of rest, play, exercise, support, reading, planning? I'm doing loads of planning with clients right now. Some of them are doing a real big protect and serve piece with their clients right now, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But also we're doing a lot of planning to rebuild. Because when we come out of this hibernation, from what I'm seeing, working with a lot of businesses in different industries, hospitality is probably one of the businesses that's been hit the hardest right now. But also they're going to be one of the businesses that are going to bounce back faster, I believe. Hospitality will probably come out the gates faster than anything. And this is logical stuff, right? I cannot wait to get out of my cave. If you're anything like me, once this lockdown is over, we're all going to like run around naked down the field and stuff. You know, we're going to want to get out and exercise. We're going to want to do things because all those restrictions have been lifted. So I think when the restrictions are lifted, they will be lifted in a controlled way. So small gatherings into medium, into larger gatherings, and everything else. But hospitality will bounce back because we've been cooped up. So we're going to want to do, go and do things. I think travel will come back next because once we can travel again, we will want to. And then it will probably retail and see the third. Manufacturing, I think, will take a little bit longer. But in terms of, we will always need stuff. So manufacturing does have a chance, but a lot of the manufacturing isn't done in the UK, as we already know. So what are you doing in those three eggs? Ask yourself and challenge yourself. How can you be more productive? What time are you wasting? Get brutally honest with yourself, but also make sure you build and rest into that. It's a vital part to build rest and the ability, the gaps that we need to reset. I am a, a, a hundred mile an hour kind of person and I am guilty continuously of thinking, do you know what, that only takes two minutes, I'll do it later. Yeah, yeah, that's only five minutes task. Yeah, I'll get onto that email, it only takes five minutes. And it doesn't because I'm doing this. So to get my head into that takes me a shift of thinking and feeling and emotion to get into this space. So then I try to send this email because I haven't templated it. I haven't got a structured email process in my sales process or my marketing plan. So I literally write this email as an individual. Hi, uh, let's, let's pick someone's name on the screen. I can see Richard Green. So hi, Richard. It's, um, it was lovely to meet you on the course. Oh, lovely. Well, that's a bit gushy. God, am I No, I can't write that. Delete, 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 delete. Hi, Richard. It was great to meet you. Oh, great. Yeah, great. To meet you. No, it was good. It was good. Yes, it was good. It was good to meet you, Richard. This five minute email goes to like an hour. And I still haven't sent the frigging thing. And then someone comes in and goes, What do you want for lunch? 
I can't think about food right now, I'm writing an email. So these five minute tasks become hour long tasks and we, our expectations, we haven't necessarily done so good at shifting our expectations on what we can achieve in a day when we're in this situation now, which we haven't found ourselves forced into in our lifetime. So it is different. We have to adapt and pivot. Something I talk about a lot with clients right now. How do we adapt and pivot? Not just our products and services, but how do we adapt and pivot our mindset, our belief structure, our identities, our habits, and our disciplines? You know, Greek philosophers years ago were asking really big questions of how, you know, why is the world round and stuff? Is it round? Is it flat? How, how do we reach the planets and all this sort of stuff? What's the purpose of life? Chinese philosopher at the same time called Confucius was asking really basic questions. And my mum never studied Confucius, but she used to say to me as a child, don't talk with your mouth full. Now she had no idea that that was a Confucius teaching, but he used to say, do one thing and be present while you're doing that one thing because you can't do too well. So you can not chew your food and enjoy your food and allow your body to process food while you're trying to talk. You certainly can't have a good conversation while you're eating food and spitting that all over me. Now I've praised what he said, right? I've given you my own little version of it, but if you want to read a book called The Andalex by Confucius, you'll get a lot of top tips and life learnings within there. The Andalex, which are written by his students. Simple principles and, and habits that you can instill into your life to change the outcomes that you're getting. We cannot keep doing the same things and expecting different results. For me, that's insanity. So what are you doing in your eights? So a couple of questions I want you to write down or screenshot to really get you thinking about where you are right now in your business and how maybe you can pivot. Firstly, I hear this, people aren't buying ads. Yeah, in some senses they're not. You know, I've just had a really tough call with a client where right now I'm digging in the trenches with them. I'm investing in with them. They've been investing in my business for a number of years. And right now they are looking at all of their cash flow and we're looking at all the predictions of what's happening. And they're really on point with this. And it makes absolutely no sense for their payment with me to keep going for this period of time. So I'm giving them a payment holiday. And I'm investing into their business because the support isn't stopping. There's no way in the world I'm going to cut that relationship and cut that support off because it's too precious to me. It's what I get out of bed to do. And I also invest into that relationship because I know longer term, it's all going to come back. So I'm protecting and serving and building on the loyalty with my existing customers, as well as signing up new customers. Because there are markets that are growing right now. Our industry, our market grows. I've, I've signed up two gyms in the last week because there's lots of people trying to get online and they don't, don't kind of know how to get online. So if there's any IT guys in here and you want to help them support them and stuff like that, do you know gyms and uh, PT and uh, coaching and training, huge industries right now that are growing. And people are pivoting online quite easily in that space because it's intellectual property. So it's easier to do as opposed to physically making widgets. So people aren't buying is a belief and a potential fact right now. But my response to that is stop selling, start serving. And this might sound odd saying, as I run a company called Sales Academy, but people come to me for sales training all the time and I'm like, look, one thing I'm gonna teach you is to stop selling because it's a vile experience. None of us have got any positive experiences to sell in, but if you can professionally help me buy, I'm gonna love you. Because when I've got cash, I like to buy stuff. And if you can help me do it better, so I can get a better deal, a better product, a better service. Yeah, I'm all in. Why do we have like shopping concierge and all this sort of stuff, right? These, these personal shoppers, because they help us buy better. So stop selling, start serving. So I want you to think about and write down the question, how can you serve your customers now better? How can you serve your customers now better? How can you invest into your customers and your relationships? How can you think of your relationships like a bank account, okay? In the sense of not transactional, but in the sense that you have to deposit credits in, emotional credits, psychological credits, make the deposits now, make the investments now. Because if you wanna make withdrawals in the future, you've gotta be able to put some stuff into an account, be able to take something out. All right, really simple but powerful principle, invest into those relationships now. So stop selling, start serving. And if that means, you know that you're not going to get business from these people. If that means that you need to change what you're doing, but you build this whole customer service element in where you're reaching out to customers and you're really giving them value and you're asking questions and you're signposting them to different areas, find out what some of their challenges are that may be nothing to do with what you offer, but you're a networker and you've got a network of people that you can point them in the direction of which could benefit them and add value to that relationship that you already have. 
there are accountants on this course, there are HR people on this course, there are people that are panicking right now because they don't know what furlough means because they've never bloody heard of it before. Right? Whereas two of my clients keep saying furlonged. No, it's not furlonged, they're not resources. <laughs> so stop selling, start serving. So let's get you thinking a couple of questions. How does your product or service benefit others? Take a screenshot of this or write the question down. How does your product or service benefit others? Now you should already know this because you've done this for a while. But what I'm asking you to do is go back to what you already know. Go back and relearn it. Go back from a customer's eyes point of view. How does your product or service benefit others? And to go deeper with that, let's get really real. Why do I want or need your product in my life? Why would I want or need it? Get really specific with this stuff, right? How does your product or service benefit others? Why would I want or need it in my life right now or at all? Then we get to the next set of questions. What would it mean to me and what would it mean to me in my life if I didn't have it? What would it mean to me if I didn't have your product and service in my life? And to go deeper then, whether I got it from you or not. What I mean by that is whether I got it from you or somebody else. Because there will be industries right now where people are offering what you offer and they're doing it cheaper because they're seeing the time to capitalize. I don't believe in discounting because discounting kills businesses. I do believe in adding value, add massive value, build a tribe, build loyalty, invest in your customers of today and invest in your customers of tomorrow. And kind of Kevin, Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams, they do come. So what would it mean to me to not have it in my life? I want you to think about that for a minute in terms of have these engaging conversations with customers if they're looking at pulling away, if they're feeling like they need to pull away. Not all of us are in key worker roles, but it's vital that we work out. One of my clients was doing two exercise sessions a week in the gym. She's now doing five exercise sessions a week with the same PT instructor, but she's doing it remotely. She's upgraded her service. Not cancelled, because she's got more time, so she's doing more exercise. Because her PT instructor's pivoted, so she's able to pivot with him. She's able to do it with her own. So there's, there's scope to grow in this space as well. So believe me, it's not all doom and gloom. I'm seeing lots of different industries with different approaches. Yes, construction's hit, architecture's hit, hospitality's hit, stuff. There's lots of different change and challenge. But also at the same time, being blunt, a lot of industries, guys, have got lazy. I don't know if you'd agree with me on this. A lot of industries have got lazy. We've kind of had it good for a long time. So this is a bit, lovely big wake up call for how we need to adapt and do differently. I got a brand new caravan outside with a tank full of fuel that I put one pound 10 in or whatever it is a liter. Yes, fill the tank on next to nothing. Can't go anywhere. Genius, little silver lining, got a tank full of teas but can't use it. What would it mean to you if you didn't have that product or service in your life? Think about your product and service like you are your customer. Go through your customer journey, go through your relationship stuff, not just when they buy on the first occasion, but how do you look after them? Look at your account management processes, look at your retention processes. How are you really adding value to your customers? Can you collaborate with other people in other businesses to add value with them? Can you become a bit of a tribe that works together with businesses and people? Because you're a consumer at the end of the day. So what would it mean to you if you didn't have those products or services? How do you get them, how do you question their thinking when they are looking at pulling away. What matters to them, what matters to you? Now on this basis, we need to bring emotional logic in. So when we look at sales, when we look at relationships, are they based on emotion or logic? Well, let's do this as an exercise. I want you to look at these live purchases and you can shout out at the screen if you want and all lean forward as you stare in, I don't mind. But what I want you to think about, the images I'm gonna show you right now, I just want instant reaction from you. I want you to think about, are these emotion or logical purchases? Does that make sense? Thumbs up if it makes sense. Cool, so you're still with me, lovely. So look at these life purchases. Do we buy these on emotion or logic? Number one, beautiful Maserati supercar. Emotion or logic? Emotion, emotion, right? A six birth super yacht. Emotion or logic? Emotion. Emotion, right? So a Learjet, emotion or logic? Emotion. emotion. Yeah. Every now and again, you get somebody go, well, it doesn't matter how many times you fly because actually chartering a flight with a private jet. Oh, shut up. It's a Learjet. I've got a pilot and a tarmac drive and Cliff is his name. It's emotion. Emotional logic. Check. No, Look check. at that. Cool. 
Look at that pool. Mm. Now look at this pool, yes. emotional logic. I don't know if you can see, see in this, but there's a slide and a staircase. <laughs> if you look really closely, the top of the slide goes through the brick wall to another part of the house. So I don't even know where the slide begins, but now <laughs> I want to buy the house because of that. That taps into my fun side. That taps into my emotional purchasing power. That taps into me as a human being because that's the kind of shit I want to wake up to. Get out of the bed, slide, woo, like once we've gone, it straight to the pool. Imagine that. <laughs> I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I bet that pool's a bugger to heat. What about keeping the pH levels correct? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, at some point, logic is going to kick in. Emotional logic. Last one. Emotion. Emotion. Imagine that view waking yeah. up to the view in the morning. My friend Mark from Bristol, he said to me, is that a bath right there by the window? I said, yes, Mark. He was like, he would have a bath right there by the window. I said, Mark, if you could afford that view, you could towel dry right up against the window, mate, and press yourself and air dry. No one's going to see you there. But people's logic will kick in at some point. So I'm going to introduce you. You already know about Pareto's law, I'm sure, the Italian philosopher. But I always bring Pareto's law in when, it, when we talk about sales and customer service and business. Because the decisions we make in life and in business, I always believe, are based in 80% emotion, but they have to follow a logical process. Think about when you bought a house in the past. Did you buy it on the particulars and how well they dealt with you? Or did you buy it when you walked up to the curb and looked at it and went, oh my God, and you opened that front door and you fell in love with that place. Love doesn't work in logic. But you have a logical brain that kicks in and go, am I making a good decision here or not? Now we start looking at those small things that we do or do not do to support our emotional decision. This is where buyer's remorse kicks in. This is where ambush kicks in. Self-ambush, spousal ambush, all that sort of stuff. So if we're not following the logical process in how we're serving people and looking after them and treating them and supporting them and managing them and retaining them and adding value in their lives and collaborating with others to be able to, then how are we creating stickiness with them in terms of emotion and logic? So... My challenge to each and every one of you as I wrap up now is right now, look at how you protect and serve. Look at your customer base and your business. Look at how you can protect and serve yourself and others. How do you protect your client base? How do you protect your customers' businesses and their interests? And if you do that with a go-giving mentality, not a go-getting mentality, if you do this with a go-getting, if you haven't read that book, guys, go read that book, Bob Bird, Go-Giver, awesome book, awesome principles. Um, <clears throat> protect and serve your customer base right now. And then once you've done some protection and serving, have a look at how you plan and build to come out of hibernation. What are we going to need to do differently? What products and services do we need to maintain? What products and services do we need to pivot and change? What products and services maybe do we need to add that we haven't currently got yet? What kind of collaborations do we need to create where our service can now be a much more wraparound service because we're tying up with, you know, I'm a trainer that works with companies. Do I need to work with a HR consultant and a, and a finance consultant who does zero and stuff? Probably, and you're probably on this call. So can we collaborate better? Because I'm not interested in taking food off your plate. I want to make more bloody plates so we can all have more fun. That's my attitude to business, right? So plan and build, strategize. My digital media company, which is uh, being launched, goes into Canada in July this year. And it's great fun because we're having loads of time to really plan content and strategy not just on our own business, but on our clients' businesses. And you know, like builders never live in finished houses and chefs never cook at home and stuff. For three years now, we've been doing social media and strategy for other businesses in Skinny Rhino, and we haven't really looked at our own. And it's like, shit, massive mistake, massive slam the brakes on. Now we need to dig in the trenches and get our own activity up and running. Because we've got to, we've got to show and walk the walk and demonstrate this stuff, not just with clients, but with our own brand as well. So... We're all guilty of making mistakes in this process. So I'm going to challenge you to plan and build better so you can make less mistakes. Slow down to speed up. Slow down to speed up. And if you want to take a screenshot of this, I really recommend it because uh, this is really the basis of why we exist. People have great ideas. I believe every single person in this room has had a great idea about their business product or service. The challenge is if you can't market it, you can't sell it, then you can't make money from it. If you can't make money from it, then it's not commercially viable. So for me, it's not about sales. It's about raising our commerciality, raising our knowledge in commerciality. You know, the, the amount of times I talk with customers and they go, yeah, well, I'm not really making that much money. And I go, okay, so let's have a look at your pricing. So how do you come up with your pricing model? And they go, well, I have a look at the market and 
these were like 50 quid and these were 100 quid. So I put myself at 75 quid. I was like, okay. So you've priced yourself averagely between two shit competitors. Just consider that for a moment because they might be really, really bad. Now you're averagely priced between two shit competitors. How does that sound now as a pricing strategy? So it's really simple stuff that we can look at, but how do we increase our commerciality, build a plan, and then we need to take small actions, build the habits, build the disciplines, think about Confucius, and then get accountability. I don't care whether it's through me or anybody else, but work with a coach, work with a consultant, work with a mentor, get accountability. There's someone that will hold you accountable to doing the things that you don't want to do, but you know you need to. And I liken this to the rich tea and the bourbons, right? If there's a barrel full of biscuits and there's bourbons and rich teas, you go for the bourbons every time. But sometimes you've got to eat the rich tea so you can enjoy the poor ones. So kind of what we do is put people at the accountability and our knowledge is given away for free. The accountability model is the business because we want to get results and it takes effort. So it's about the implementation. <coughs> so if you want to book a strategy session with me, you're more than welcome to. Following this call as a gift, I said to Rich, I would give this to every one of you. Because it's an open session, it's kind of like 100 mile an hour session with you for, for 30 minutes. If I've triggered some thoughts in you today and you want to take it further to just ask some questions. I said it at the start, so I'll say it again in case any of you weren't on. Not everything I do comes with an invoice. So these are free strategy sessions where I will gift you time and effort to challenge your thinking around your business model. There's a couple of exercises we'll get through in, and then we'll figure out from there what you can do. Now, I, well, I can point you in direction. We may end up working together, we may not. You might like my content, but you don't like the fact that I speak and swear like a fishwife. I don't know, I don't care. I'm cool with it, I just want to help you grow. Because I come at this abundantly. I love life, I love business, and I love people. So if we combine that stuff together, we can have some fun. So I don't chase you because I'm not that kind of salesperson. I won't do that stuff, and I'll teach you. You don't have to either. So here's my contact details. I'm busy, but if you want a time, time with me, you can book me in, and I'll figure some time out, and we'll do this over Zoom because we're not traveling anywhere, are we, at the moment? So I don't really do emails. I don't like emails. I'm hoping that VoIP and um, conference calls and Zoom will really overtake, you know those nitty gritty email chains you get? I really hope that this lockdown shows us that we don't need that shit. We can just go, should we get a Zoom call and nail this in two minutes? Brilliant. Because those nitty gritty email chains are annoying as hell. But email's important when you're sharing documents and we need to review stuff, yeah. But if you want to contact me, guys, I'm a human being. Pick up the phone to me, WhatsApp me, Instagram me, whatever. Ask for that time and we'll book it in, right? And we'll, look at, we'll get it arranged. And I'll, I'll do this in the next two weeks so we'll get some time with you. And I want to challenge you to think and act differently. So that's me. That's the time. It's kind of handing back to, to Richard now. And the guys, I just need to stop sharing. And all I wanted to say, one final thing is thank you for having me. I'm going to stay for the Q&A. And uh, anything I've said that triggers, if you want to challenge me on anything, please feel free to, because I love a, I love a debate. It's what society is built on. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Adam. That's brilliant. Um, I've got a quick question for you straight away. Yeah. Uh, what What's the first thing you say to someone who says, "I can't, I can't afford to keep my business running anymore. Um, I'm going to have to shut up shop." <laughs> so instant response, which is my competitive brain, goes, um, "How can you afford not to?" Now, um, I'm not being flippant with this. There's two things because there is a financial economic impact to all of this. I get it. There are people that are going to be drastically affected by this, their livelihoods and everything, and therefore our businesses will be affected to the side of it. So I get it. There is also lots of support coming in from the government, and there's already a lot of support anyway. So it's a kind of balancing act of that. But when I'm saying I'm not being flippant, from a psychology point of view, when I was in a previous life as a, as a um, rehabilitation of offenders, I was in an offender's house. He will remain nameless, but he pulled a shotgun on me. I had training for how to deal with hostage situations, different things. I used to train people on that stuff. But when a shotgun's poured on you in someone's living room at three o'clock in the morning, you don't know what to do. So I, I lit my finger and stuck it in the barrel of the gun. It was the instinct thing to do. He looked down at the gun. I twisted the barrel over that way and nearly broke his finger off. I then ran out of the house, pointing the, bar the, kind of the butt of the shotgun at them with the barrel towards me, kind of waving at them together. Went around the corner, got in the car, drove away 15 minutes later, couldn't drive, my legs went like jelly. Ugh. I filled out an incident report, sent it into the team because I had to, dropped the gun off at the police station. I then got a bollocking for not following procedure. Now, I'm sharing this point with you, Rich, because in times of kind of crisis and other things, we don't always think we need to instinctively behave. 
your instincts will show you and guide you what to do. Don't let fear drive that stuff. But there's a thing in psychology called pattern interact and pattern redirect. His pattern of thinking was he was going to shoot me because I was going to take him back to prison. So the only way I can deflect that is I need to interrupt his tape that he's on. It's like a CD that's playing on loop. I need to interrupt that pattern of thinking and I need to redirect his pattern of thinking somewhere else, which was his finger that really hurt. That saved my life, right? So what patterns of thinking are you going around at the moment that are potentially going to give you, you or your business the horse injection? So what can you do to interrupt those patterns of thinking and redirect those patterns of thinking to get a different result? So if you physically, financially have to, my heart goes out to you, but don't allow fear to paralyze you. All right? Brilliant. Uh, anyone else got any uh, burning questions to ask Adam if you want to uh, mute yourself and, uh, and ask away? No, uh, maybe someone later on. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Adam. Uh, okay, if we move on to our, our Q&A with our uh, expert speakers, um, if we could just go around the, the speakers first, just to introduce yourselves. Um, and then um, and then we'll move on to questions. If you have got any other questions, please put them into the uh, into the into the chat box. Um, it's really good to to get so many people on the on the uh, the Zoom call today. Um, if we start with Sharon, do you want to go first? No pressure. Um, hi everybody. So I'm Sharon. I run Kinder Pocock. We are digital accountants. So we've all been working from home for ages. Um, and uh, it's not affected how we look after people. But I'd just say in this, I'm, I agree with everything Adam's saying. You've got to keep going. Um, you've got to uh, support your clients and your customers. We've basically, um, what we've done is we've we've pushed the day job to one side, the stuff we normally do, and all we've been doing is speaking to clients and making sure they're okay, doing webinars, um, millions of mail shots with up-to-date information. So um, I think it's really key, whatever you can do to uh, keep engaging with your clients and customers, make sure they're all right, and uh, keep looking forwards to the positivity, because we are gonna come out of this. Sorry, that was a bit long. No, that's fine, that's brilliant, great. Okay, Chris. How's it going? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Amazing presentation, Adam. Good, as good as last time, even better, better than last time, actually, well done. Uh, and the same as Sharon, I echo everything you've said, really. So, um, but I'm Chris, uh, so I run a digital marketing agency in Hereford. I've uh, been doing it for about 10 years. Uh, we're feeling the impact, as everyone else is. We've got people increase, decrease, change, pause, uh, giving service away for free. Um, and like I keep saying to people at the moment, you know, you've got to think about uh, short-term loss, long-term gain. That's what you're aiming for about with all this at all times. So, um, you know, if you can build those relationships, keep them strong for now, that's what's going to pay off later. So, um, and I'm obviously here to answer any questions. If we can help you in any way, we will do. Okay, brilliant. And um, Caroline, I know I dropped you in at the, la at the last minute. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself? Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, um, apologies. I, I came in at the back end of that, so uh, I, I missed uh, I missed some of Adam's, but it all sounded amazing. So thanks, Adam. Um, I'm Caroline Knight. Um, I'm from uh, J Consult HR, so I provide HR um, advice and support to uh, to SMEs, uh, and also from Lucid Coaching. So I'm a, a coach. Um, so I've been spending my time more recently. Um, coaching and supporting really in the well-being space because there's an awful lot of well-being that's required at the moment. Um, I think it's been absolutely key for people to get a handle on where they are at the moment. It's really difficult for everybody. Um, so supporting them mentally um, is, has been really key. So focusing on that more than, more than the HR side, because I think that's come, kind of gone to one side. Uh, but obviously there's a lot of issues in terms of, um, uh, as we were talking about furloughing, et cetera. So here to help and support as I can uh, in the Hereford area and surrounding. Um, so yes, hi. <laughs> That's Great. me. That's brilliant. Okay, so I'm going uh, to move on to the, to the questions that we had 
um, when we when we first launch the event. So I've had some questions in advance. Um, so I'm just going to try and rattle through these. Our, our expert speakers have already had the questions, so hopefully they've done some homework and know what the, what what the answers are. And we're going to start with Sharon again. And the first question now is: My employer has put me on furlough. Does this mean I can look for another job or do voluntary work? Over to you. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, um, you you can volunteer, and I would encourage that. Um, you can look for other work, but only if it's in your current employment contract. So um, the thing with all these new rules and furlough rules and everything is they keep changing. So keep up to date as far as you can. The first guidance that came out was that if you were furloughed, you cannot work for anybody else. Um, but now the guidance is saying if your employment contract normally allows you to work for someone else or you've got that arrangement with them, get it in writing, um, then you can. Uh, work, take another job. Um, the other thing is if you already have two or more separate jobs already before all this started, you can be furloughed from one and still work for the other one, um, or you can be furloughed from both of them and you get the you get your furlough, well your employer will get your furlough grant for each of them and be able to pay you. Okay. Does that answer that? Yeah, I think so. Um, and the second one for you, um, I just received the small business grant, which bill should I pay and which one should I keep? That, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, well done for getting the business grant. Um, if, any, if there's anyone here who hasn't got their business grant, this is um, uh, if you get small business rates relief or rural rates relief or you're in retail, hospitality or leisure, I know Herefordshire Council has given out most of their grants, so um, we can probably not widely publicise, but I've got the number in the email. If anybody needs it, I can give it to Rich to follow, if you wanted to follow that up. Um, this has got to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'm going to answer it in a roundabout way. Which bills should you pay and which should you not? First of all, look at the things you can get a payment holiday on. So there's the mortgage, um, three-month mortgage holiday you have to ask for. Uh, that shouldn't affect, that won't affect your credit control. Um, if you've got a landlord personally or commercially, speak to them about a payment holiday. Um, I'm not going to advise you not to pay your rent, but uh, if you do have a landlord and you're struggling with your rent and they haven't given you a holiday, they are not allowed to take you to court and evict you for three months. And this three month period is to the end of May, but obviously if things do go on longer than that, then the government will review that. Um, in terms of costs, I think you've got to look at what's important to you. So. If you can't get any repayment holidays on loans or mortgages, then I think they're important because of your credit rating and stuff. Um, and you've got to look at each supplier and what they're providing you with. So rather than not paying anyone at all, can you renegotiate payment terms? So we're all in this together. So I started with my clients saying, hold on to your cash as much as you can try to delay payment but actually we need to support each other so if you can support your local businesses this is a moral thing isn't it so I'm inclined to support my local suppliers before national ones is that a fair thing to say um, and when you're looking at what bills to pay so I think definitely have those difficult conversations have the cheeky conversations you know we're all winging it at the moment so have the difficult conversations with suppliers and see how you can um, delay or spread payment with them so that they're getting something and not nothing but now is the time to really look at the as well. so look in your bank statements for the last one to three months uh, personal and business and see what things you don't need um, and see what things you spent that you now don't need to spend and, and cancel or reduce as much as you can big one for us would be software subscriptions we all probably are have got software subscriptions we either don't use or we've got too many users we're paying for or too many features so that's uh, my top tip is look at your software subscription and reduce them um, that's brilliant um i think there's another question coming from richard um, Sharon, it's been said that furloughed workers 
cannot work elsewhere in the hours that they worked for you. What's your take on that? I think that again, so first of all, furloughed workers, if you're furloughed from unemployment, you cannot do any work for them at all. You can't even send emails. Um, in terms of working other hours, my understanding is that that is that does depend on what's in your original employment contract because it's worth noting that the new furlough rules and provisions uh, do not override any existing employment contracts. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, thanks, Caroline. So that's uh, my understanding. It might, that I haven't heard that, Richard, but it, it might be that that's, um, that's not in the guidance that I've looked at, but it might be relating to individual employment contracts. So just be really careful with what, what contracts you've got, or if you're negotiating something outside of your contract, make sure you've got all that in writing. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for that. Um, did you want to um, plug your, uh, your uh, Facebook group and things? Well, I'd be rude not to. Thank you very much. So, um, <laughs> so um, Rich is in. Uh, we've got a private Facebook group. Let me just get the link. So this is for small businesses. Um, it's it's a private page. We ask some questions. Hang on. Uh, hang on. Technology multitasking. Copying and pasting. I'm speaking is not working. Um, so we ask a few questions before we let you in so that we've only got business owners and not employees. So feel free to join, that's in the chat. Um, and we're updating that. If there's like relevant business updates with the daily briefings from the government, we're virtually live typing in there before we go anywhere else. So, and then we've got um, regular Monday. Should I just put all my links in really quickly? Yeah. <laughs> Um, or I can just put them in as you carry on talking if you want. Yeah, so you've okay, got like no yeah, no problem. Okay, regular well, webinars and all sorts. I'll just stick the links in. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, we'll move on to uh, more questions then. Chris, questions for you. Yeah. Uh, first question: Is it worth spending cash on Google or Facebook ads at this time, or should we hold fire? So it's an interesting question uh, for two reasons, really. It'll depend on whether people are still buying off that current business at the time. Um, and it's kind of relevant to what Adam was talking about before in that the customer cycle's changed, okay, in a lot of businesses. People or people will come and have a look at a website, they'll look at a product, look at a brand, but must not necessarily buy. Um, you have to be a little bit careful in how you're potentially tracking these people through your website. So, for example, if you're spending money on AdWords or Facebook, um, driving traffic to your business is your objective to get them to convert to buy something or are you looking which i mentioned in my um, comments earlier on for what we would call a, a micro conversion where they sign up for a newsletter an email uh, updates about corona or whatever it's going to be um that you can then come back and revisit sell sell to them later so it's it's the approach that you need to take i would say that if you have the opportunity to take the free advertising that facebook and uh, google adwords are using so for example um, AdWords are throwing loads of money at people at the moment to try and get them to use their platform. Uh, Facebook are doing the same. Use the free budget, test it, trial it. If it's not converting and it's not becoming monetary value, then don't do it. Okay, just be a little bit careful. Where your efforts are better spent at the moment, structure your website, content, SEO, making sure that you're, you're getting your website ready for later. Um, uh, because it is, Adam hit the nail on the head, people aren't necessarily buying at the moment, so don't try and ram it down their throats. So I'd be very careful with it. Okay. Have, have you got any links or way of finding out about this free? I will post them all for you. Absolutely. So the, the Google AdWords one, the Google AdWords one tends to be is if you set up an account, they'll credit you £120 to start off with. There is rumours that they're potentially going to double or treble that at some point, um, So which is potentially free £400 with free advertising. So we're just waiting to hear a bit more about it. Um, the Facebook one, uh, I'll share the link on that one somewhere along as well. Brilliant. People, people might not be buying, but they're looking. They've got a lot of time to look at the moment and plan and make decisions. Exactly that. So it, it depends. You've got to think about your budget a little bit different. Uh, with, with AdWords and Facebook budgets, we tend to spend because you can get return very quickly um, so you can make it measurable. The, the measures, the metrics are all changed. So you've got to go, right, okay, if I'm investing £120 or £500 into AdWords at this point, you know, do I expect the sale to come in this week, next week, three months or four months or whatever? And are you happy to live with that and take that risk? You know, it's a, is it a calculated risk? But my, my, my safest piece of advice is just get them to sign up for something. 
So you've got their email. The minute you've got their email, you can resell and remarket to them at a later date. Um, so we're working with a campaign at the moment, for example, that is, is very much on based on a remarketing campaign. So they're coming through the website using AdWords, and setting up ads to follow them around for the next 90 days. You know, so we know that buying cycle has extended. So in that 90 day period, we're hoping that the potential um, customer behavior is going to change and they will start to buy later. Um, but it is, you need to speak to a digital agency, so just be a little bit careful or just use you know, a calculated uh, approach, be a little bit careful. Okay, that's great. Um, and the second question for you, and probably Adam might have a, a view on this as well. My business is a cafe and it's currently closed. Which is the best way to keep in touch with my customers? That's an interesting one. So, um, okay, so obviously, if, if, depending on how they've get engaged with in the past, things like Facebook, social media, definitely email marketing, as long as they've opted in GDPR. I see there's a GDPR question on here, which I can also pick up if you want me to. Um, but I'm sure the HR people may jump on that one, I don't know. So, um, you know, so I think you just need to be a little bit careful. Each customer is, is, is very personal. So, Think I, I've explained this to in another group the other day. Be more personal with everything you're doing at the moment. And Adam again resonates with what Adam was saying. If you come at every single person with a personal approach, you've got a lot of more time on your hands at the moment. So don't do any mass marketing, don't do mass emailing. You know, spend some time compiling emails, send it out nicely in a template as Adam touched on earlier on, so it's nicely formatted and you're off to go, but it can still become personal. So um, because people want to be handheld, they want cushioning, they want help. You know, they want to know that you're going to be there at the end of it because it's reassurance for them to you know we're in a massive uncertain time at the moment for a lot of people. So as a business owner, you should, you're not just a business owner no, no more. You are a friend. You are a person there. You're a confident, whatever you want to be. And actually, those people will remember you at the end of this journey. So, you know, I think that, you know, Facebook, engage with social media, email and even a phone call. If you've got time to make phone calls, take the risk and make the phone call. If you've got 100 customers at the end of it because you've spoke, spoke to them on the phone, okay, that means you've still got a business. Yeah, absolutely. Just a, a couple of, I've seen pubs, cafes and stuff before they were forced to close. They were, they were doing takeouts, Sunday lunch takeouts and all this sort of stuff. And I recommended a, a photographer friend of mine who's a content creator to spend some time with these guys because their images were beautiful. And I don't mean to be crude, they just were. And there's nothing worse than a great meal on a plate. So if you, if you are a cafe right now, remind us of the service, remind us of the experience that we get. Because as I said earlier, going back, as soon as I come out of my cave, I can't wait to go and experience the things that I've been missing and taking for granted. So show me, get, some, get a professional photographer, you can do this remotely and stuff like that, like, but get some really decent images and a bank of content, as Chris was saying, so that you're ready to come out of the gate. Remind us of what you've done for, remind us why you're good, remind us why we love you, you know, and be ready to hit the market as soon as we're ready to. So, absolutely. We, we've got, um, at that point, uh, go on. We've got a, a food photography client. I was talking to them yesterday about what they can do now because obviously they can't be contacted. Well, they can't, obviously, social distancing, but they've got a whole library of photos for all their clients. So they're going to get in touch with them and say, you know, here are your photos. Here's some ideas on how you can get out there. Exactly what you said, Adam. Like, we're, all, we're all in it and we're all stuck at home, not just as business owners, but as people. And we're missing all these things. So it's, it's, what can you do to motivate your clients and customers as well make them feel better and as soon as as soon as possible when we've got some clarity on when we can get back to a new normal when can you start encouraging people to make bookings because if your images and you're in front of them like adam and chris have said then uh, you're going to be the first person that they book with yeah. when, when we're back absolutely one of the things brad's doing the content guy is he's he's teaching he's getting into some zoom calls with clients and stuff and for, he's, he's teaching about layering and staging images and stuff and it's like you can still cook in your cafe right you can still cook at home whatever so cook the meals plate them up but he's showing them how to stage it with nice herbs and on a on a wooden That's basket That's what he would go through so that they can create some of these type of images because we've all got these super, super phones now that have got these brilliant cameras on them but they're not a dfm camera no of course they're not but in terms of ability to get high level image, step across to your photographer to then be able to do some or designers to create stuff with, 
if we find, if we have the will, we will find a way. If we don't, we'll find excuses. So, okay. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Great answers. Uh, okay, and I've got one question for uh, Caroline and uh, probably Sharon as well. Uh, I worked in a restaurant, but my employer sacked me. I asked them to furlough me, but he said he couldn't afford it. I thought the government were paying the furlough payments. What can I do? So I think the first thing to bear in mind is that the furlough, as, as um, Sharon said before, the furlough runs on top of normal contracts. So normal employment law, it's not, it's not separate to and instead of. So your basic contract is where it all starts. Now, he mentioned about uh, being sacked. It kind of depends what, what that means exactly. Uh, what was the reason for that? Um, whether he was in a situation where the the organisation couldn't, the restaurant couldn't afford to to have him on board? Was he laid off? Was he short term working? Is that something that is an, a contractual term within his contract? If they're allowed to do that, it will be in the contract. Uh, and if it is, then they can. At the end of the day, so have, have employees got a right to be furloughed? Well, no, they don't. It, it's entirely up to the organisation whether uh, whether they do that. It, it's a matter for them because it's a matter for them whether they can run their business with the amount of people that they have in these difficult times. Um, so the selection of which employees are going to be furloughed is is entirely up to the employer, um, and it, it really. It, it's a difficult one if you don't know what the circumstances of that that sort of sacking, if you want to call it. Um, what's the reason for that? There may be something underlying that we don't know about. So let's understand what what is that what is that about? Um, bottom line is they don't have a natural right. You don't have a right to be or not be furloughed. The other thing to bear in mind is if it's purely that um, that person was was taken out because the organization or, or the restaurant couldn't support them the other thing that you could do is perhaps get back in touch with them and say look you are in a situation where you've got you know two or three of us we all do the same job is it possible that after this block of three weeks um, somebody else could be sort of taken out of the system and then i could be furloughed because you can rotate furloughing you can have to do it in blocks of three weeks, but it doesn't have to be the same person and it can be rotated so that you use the skill base of different people in your business. So that it's not, a, it's not a, a complete stop. You know, there are other things he can do or she can do, but it really boils down to what's on the contract, what's in the implied or, or expressed terms of that contract because it's still in place, whatever happens. So. Okay. Can I add into that? Um, I absolutely agree with everything Caroline said. Um, I think from the government's point of view there, the furloughing is a mechanism, sorry, they treat the employer as the mechanism to get the payment to the employee so then they're not um, struggling. Um, and I absolutely agree, we don't know why, why the person was sacked, so that's yeah um but uh, the comment about it costing too much the 80 percent furlough is for 80 percent of the gross pay 80 percent of the employer's national insurance and the employer's pension contribution so it's just the administrative cost really you don't as an employer you don't have to top up the remaining 20 percent so you could argue there isn't an additional cost apart from the admin and processing and everything uh, yeah and that's that's why it's important to understand what the circumstances are because in real terms yes they can pay it and yes they will be able to claim it back um so how many people are in the business what is the state of the business the organization the the, the person owning the restaurant may just feel that they can't manage so that might be a discussion to be had between them and some other support to extend and do this, these are the circumstances. Uh, you can bring them back into the system and then furlough them. So that the, it is quite flexible because, as as we've said, you know, everybody's in this together. We're we're creating we're creating situations now, and and this is legislation that's only just come in, um, and it's having to be having to be moulded and shaped as the days go by. 
Um, so if circumstances dictate, they will change again because that's that's one of the sureties of this. There is no surety. So uh, <laughs> it's it's circumstances. Um, okay. I think if I can just chip in with Caroline there for a moment. Um, as a leader in large corporate and stuff at times, we, being blunt, I don't believe that corporate values HR the way that they need to, not services, because it's like a, when, the, when the horse is already bolted, they go, oh my God, now we need to get HR in, it's too late then. Now what do we do? <laughs> yeah. so I don't know whether you're seeing some of this, but I've seen some of this in. there will be some bad behaviours within companies right now, because from the phrases I've heard, right? on LinkedIn to shed some dead wood. So it goes back to the contract. The point you made is so important. Individuals need to check, have they got a contract in place and what's in it before they ask? And then the the amount of employers that, especially casual labor in kind of cafes and stuff like this, and it's it's more kind of agency stuff. It's more uh, uh, someone's friend down the cricket club starts working and have they really put the contracts in place? So now is really a time to look at their mm -hmm. contracts for their policies and procedures so that they can get prepared to come out of this better because they can't change what's already happened but they can put some things in place now working with somebody like Caroline to make sure the business is protected because I genuinely mm -hmm. think there will be a lot of tribunals coming off the back of this with some bad behavior with some companies but yeah no I, 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 I do echo that um, there are circumstances where um, not so nefarious but there are there are circumstances where there are people being um utilized in different ways uh, and there are people that are, are falling foul of making decisions that actually shouldn't be being made at this point in time um you mentioned about deadwood yes there are circumstances when we think okay well now's a good time to do some redundancies let's do that but i think we have to bear in mind that no, the law hasn't changed if you're going to make people redundant, there has to be proper process and reasons for doing it. And now is not the time to be making those decisions when everybody is in such a state of flux and, uh, and the levels of stress and trauma um, going through this process and coming out the other side is, is tremendous on everybody. Um, so I think understanding about where you are with your business and if there are concerns that you have, don't make any knee jerk reactions just talk to somebody because there are so many other ways you can do things. And even if you haven't done things in the past or you haven't got contracts in place or there's things that you think you should have done and all of a sudden you haven't done them, there are ways around this, you know, process and procedures aside, there are always things that you can do. Um, don't, don't panic and don't do any new knee reactions. Just think about circumstances and, and talk to somebody, talk to me, talk to anybody, whoever it is you think is going to help you. Um, before you make any major decisions. So, definitely. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you uh, for our experts. Sharon's had to shoot off to another uh, call. Uh, we've hit our two o'clock uh, time when we, we said we'd be finishing. So uh, we're going to wrap up now. Thanks, Adam, for, uh, for your talk earlier. And I, I hope uh, everyone's uh, benefited from uh, taking part today. We are going to look at doing another one of these uh, probably in two weeks' time uh, with another speaker. I have asked uh, Kalita Dainton, who was going to be one of our speakers at the expo, and hopefully she's going to be uh, our guest speaker for that event. In, uh, in t that'll be in two weeks' time, so that's the 22nd of um, April. Um, so uh, thank you all for, for attending and joining. I hope you benefited from it. It is, it is being recorded, so hopefully I'll send the recording over to everyone uh, if they, if they want to have a look at it. If you want to have a look at the chat, the chat is available uh, for you to look at as well and, uh, and, and take a copy of. Uh, but that's all from me and from Hey Chambers, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Please stay safe. Thank you for organising, Mitch. Thanks, Rich.